Well, do you ever feel like that when you're praying, like you're just sort of making things up as you go along? You're not really sure what you're supposed to say. You don't know how to pray good like someone else does. You don't know the nicknames of God. You're not John the Baptist's little sister or something, and so you're not really sure how to do it right. End up saying things like, I I believe I can fly. Amen. I remember as a teenager when I first came to faith, I was uh, really passionate about my faith. Uh, some friends of mine and I had a really kind of cool experience with God. We became very passionate about our faith and about following Jesus. In fact, we, we for fun, and this isn't really normal behavior for a lot of teenagers, I realize this, but for fun we would get together and pray together. That's what we did. On Friday night, hey, do you want to get together and pray? I know you guys are judging me and think that I was a nerd or something like this, but I really kind of came out of a really rebellious season where we were kind of entrenched in the drug culture and the drug scene and kind of we had this experience with God and we realized that that stuff didn't really satisfy us and, and really when you experience God for who he is, it changes everything and when we pray together, there's something really special and something really cool that happens in our hearts and our spirits that really doesn't compare to the best high that we can experience out there and so we would pray together and we'd pray for hours and we didn't know what we were doing. We were trying to like lay hands on people. We were saying weird things, probably like, I believe I can fly, amen, and things like this. I remember some adults uh, kind of heard us praying one time, adults from the church that we were part of, and they were really concerned because we were saying things that probably we shouldn't say when we pray. I, I can't remember exactly what they were concerned about, but I remember them being really concerned that some of the things that we were saying maybe weren't in the Bible or weren't totally scriptural or, or whatever. And I'm sure that they had the best intentions, but I remember feeling kind of frustrated. We're like, we, we might not know what we're doing, but at least we're trying. At least we're praying. At least we're doing something, right? And I think, to be honest, God's much more concerned about the heart than he is about the method when it comes to prayer. So you ever felt like this guy, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I'm not comfortable. Like, don't worry about it. It's not about the words that come out of our mouth. It's about the heart. It's about where we're at. And in our hearts, in my heart as a teenager, I believed deep down, we believed deep down that prayer worked. That prayer changed things. That our prayers mattered. That's why we prayed on Friday night for our friends. That's why we prayed for our church. That's why we prayed for our youth group. We believed that it made a difference in the world. That prayer changes things. And that's really the question or, or the problem that I think that most people have in regards to prayer, right? Not so much about how to pray or what to say, the method that we use when we pray, although that certainly is a question or a problem for a lot of us. But I think the question that we really wrestle with, the problem that that is really hard for us, is a little bit deeper than the method of prayer. And, And it's more a question about whether or not prayer really works. Whether or not prayer actually makes a difference in the real world or whether or not we're just wasting our time and saying these words To God, does God answer prayer or not? Does prayer make a real difference in the real world or not? Because it doesn't take a genius. I mean, all you got to do is look around the world and see all the brokenness and all the war and and all the conflict and even just look at some of our relationships and some of the stuff going on in our lives and we see like life is not the way it should be and people are praying. I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for this situation. People are praying for what's going on in Iraq and it continues to happen. So does prayer work or does it not? Does prayer make a difference or not? It's a really important question, I think, for us to wrestle with. And some folks, some critics, would probably answer that question with an emphatic no. Absolutely, prayer is a waste of time. Save your breath. It's just weak people trying to deal with their problems and escaping from reality. That's all that prayer is. That's what a critic might say. Maybe that's what some of us even might say to some degree. But of course, the the Christian faith would answer that question very differently. The Bible would provide a much different perspective to this question than that, that's for sure. And and that is that prayer uh, prayer is absolutely critical to a life of faith and to seeing God work in our lives. That prayer works, that God does, in fact, answer prayer. You could check it out. In the Bible, James 5 verse 16 on the screen, you can see it there where it says this, that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 
I'm going to read that again. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The bottom line is, according to James and according to other places in the scriptures, is that prayer works. Prayer changes things. Prayer produces wonderful results. That when a righteous person prays, which, by the way, is not a person who's really good or really well behaved or really good moral person. It's not about how holy you are or how much you love Jesus. A righteous person is anybody who is in Christ. It's Christ who makes us righteous because of what he's done for us on the cross. So when anybody who's in Christ, a righteous person, prays, those prayers, the Bible says, have great power and produces wonderful results. So the, the word earnest prayer. I love that word earnest prayer. It's not just speaking to the emotion or the passion like what I had as a teenage boy that we we're just really passionate and, and really into prayer. It's not just about the emotion, although I'm sure emotion is a part of it. It's about praying constantly, but being consistent in our prayers, being committed to a lifestyle of prayer, that when we're committed to that kind of prayer, it has great power and produces wonderful results. And when we pray earnestly, constantly with our hearts full engaged, fully engaged, God shows up and does incredible things, produces wonderful results, James says. Prayer is productive. Reality is, is that we live in a culture where nobody wants to be unproductive, right? Nobody wants to waste their time. Nobody wants to invest time and energy into something that doesn't bring results, that doesn't bear fruit. It's all about up and to the right. Am I right? And at times we think about prayer and we don't see tangible results immediately. I prayed for X and I didn't get Y, so therefore prayer doesn't work. We can wonder, does prayer actually work? And James says, absolutely it does. Not necessarily like a trending graph might present us with data that says, hey, I prayed 10 times and this is what happened as a result. It's not necessarily as... Uh, you know, specific as that all the time. It's a bit of a mystery. We're not totally sure how prayer works and how God answers prayer, but scripture is clear that prayer changes things. It's productive to pray. And so the question uh, for us this morning, I think, is a little bit deeper even than does prayer work, but how can we know if our prayers work? How can we know if our prayers are effective, if God's hearing our prayer, if our prayers change things? Because a lot of the times we pray for stuff, it feels like nothing changes and nothing happens. So how can we know for sure that our prayers are effective, that our prayers work, that God hears them and wants to answer prayer? Well, there's a great story that speaks to this in the Bible. In Acts 12, verses 1 to 17, about uh, the apostle Peter escaping miraculously from, from prison. If you want to follow along with me, you can follow along on the screen, or I'm going to talk through it with you. You can flip there in your Bible, Acts 12, verses 1 to 17. The story begins in verse 1, where we discover that the king, King Herod Agrippa, who was a Roman king, a Roman ruler reigning over much of Israel at that time, we read that this king had it out for the Christians, for followers of Jesus, for the church. The text tells us that Agrippa, King Herod, was persecuting the church, that he was going after them one by one, probably trying to put an end to this movement known as the church. In fact, the text tells us that he actually captured one of the key leaders of the church, James, who had been one of Jesus' disciples, and he had James killed. Put to death, in fact, by the sword. And when someone was put to death by the sword in those times, that usually meant that they had been executed because they were seen as a political enemy, as an enemy of the state, that they were a threat to the king's kingdom in some way or another. And so this king, uh, King Herod, in all likelihood, saw James and the church that James helped to lead as a threat to him politically. And he, no doubt, wanted to take care of that, wanted to take care of the threat. And of course, the best way to do that, the best way to take care of the threat, to remove the threat, was to target the key leaders of the church. And so he didn't stop with James, who was one of the key leaders in the church. He wanted to go after kind of the big dog himself, the main leader of the church, the apostle Peter. 
The apostle who Jesus said, upon this rock, upon this person, I will build my church. That's who King Herod wanted to get. I'm going to get the main guy himself, Peter. And so that's exactly what he did. And he went out and he had Peter arrested and thrown into jail to await trial. Presumably, when Peter would be executed publicly as a message to the rest of the watching church, to the rest of those who would want to oppose King Herod, as a political statement to anybody who would oppose King Herod and his kingdom. Well, the rest of the church, as you can imagine, I'm sure, was terrified. I mean, they had to be. How could they not have been? They, they not only had lost one of their main leaders in James, and, and not only James, but others were being persecuted as well. They were about to then now probably lose their main leader in Peter. And they had to know that, you know, this wasn't going to just stop at Peter, that their lives were also in danger, that King Herod would more than likely come after them as well, and he would do whatever it took to put an end to this movement known as the church. So how did the church respond? What did they do? Well, they did what you and I would do. When they sat down, they came up with a plan as to how to break Peter out of jail, right? And they grabbed some crowbars, and they went down to the jailhouse, and they started busting heads. And so, no, that's, that's not actually what happened. Some of you are like, really? That, the Bible says that? No, they didn't resort to human planning or to human methods like maybe you and I would. Instead, we read that they prayed. Verse 5 says this, But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly. There's our word again, earnestly for him. It's a powerful statement. Things are about as bad as they could possibly be for these people, for this early church, for this movement of Jesus' followers. One of their leaders had been killed. One of their uh, main leaders was about to be killed. Things didn't look good at all, about as desperate as you could get. But, the text says, but the church prayed very earnestly for him. It's like Luke, who is the author of this story and the author of the entire book of Acts, is saying, yeah, 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 things are really bad. People are getting killed and persecuted and, and Peter's life is on the line. But don't worry about it. The church is praying. The church has a plan. Don't, like, Everybody can just relax because the church is praying. It's like, but don't worry about it. We're praying about it. It's interesting to me because prayer was instinctive, it seems, for the church. Like it was their plan A for dealing with a really bad, really hard, really scary situation. And not just praying, but praying earnestly, the text tells us, which as we remember, means praying constantly, not just really emotionally or really passionately, although I'm sure that they did. It meant that they were praying constantly. They, they just like stopped what they were doing and started praying all the time. That's what they did. That's how they responded. 24-hour prayer, more than likely. Earnestly they prayed. It's sort of backwards as to how we approach life uh, most of the time, isn't it? I, I know it is for me anyway, that when things go wrong in my life, when there's a problem... It's presented before me that I instinctively go right into problem-solving mode. Like, what do I have to do to fix this problem, to make this situation go away? And, and prayer is sometimes, to be honest, a bit of a last resort for me when I don't know what else to do, when my problem-solving efforts have failed, or, you know, when my efforts have not delivered the results that I want, okay, now I'll, I'll pray, and maybe even pray earnestly, because I'm, you know, if this thing doesn't get fixed, I'm in big trouble. And I, I suspect I'm not the only one in the room who does that. Now look, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't problem solve and that we shouldn't spend some time figuring out, you know, how we can act and how we can respond to life's problems. I'm not saying that you should just say, oh, just pray about it and all your problems will go away. Don't worry about anything. We can just pray and life will be grand. That's not actually always often how it works. I think most of the time, like 99.999% of the time, God's plan is to use people and our brains and our problem-solving capabilities to make this world a better place, right? He works through doctors to heal people. He works through people, friends, to bring advice. That's how he works. He answers prayers, more often than not, through other people. That's often the way 
it works. So I'm not questioning how God works or whether or not we should problem solve. God gave us brains and we should use our brains to solve problems. The question that I'm asking, kind of where I'm pushing us back on, is whether or not we're instinctively a people of prayer or a people of a plan. Are you a person of prayer or a person of a plan? And I think Jesus would invite us to be people who plan, but pray through our plan. Ask Jesus to guide our plan. Ask, people, ask Jesus to direct our plan as we go. That we wouldn't just plan absent-minded away from Christ and his plan for us. That we would invite him into the process from the beginning and ask him to guide us by his spirit through the plan, through the next steps. How can we fix this problem? What's on your heart, Jesus, for this situation? Are you instinctively a person of prayer or a person of planning? Well, the church in our story in Acts 12 were people who seemed to instinctively pray. That was sort of their go-to move, their plan A. And the crazy thing is, at least in this story, is that their prayers worked. That their prayers actually made a very significant difference. In our story, it was the night before Peter was about to go to trial when he would likely be executed There were prison guards everywhere, four squads or four guards all around the prison. Peter was asleep in his cell in between two soldiers bound with two chains. I think it's safe to say when you would see this scene, he's not going anywhere, right? There's no getting out of this. Unless the church's prayers are answered and God performs a miracle. Well, verse 7, we read just that. We read this. It says, Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off of his wrists. <laughs> Maybe you've heard this story before, and you think, Yeah, that stuff happened. It's the Bible. Like, it's crazy. Could you imagine being Peter? You're thinking your life is done. You wake up in the middle of the night to an angel kicking you, probably in the side, saying, hey, come on, get up. Like, I get annoyed when Kim elbows me, when the kids are up in the night and says, hey, it's your turn or whatever. Like, I, you know, it'd be kind of crazy. I mean, it is kind of like an angel, I guess. Oh, uh, but yeah. Um, <laughs> thought that one in advance. I had to, uh, yeah, that's right. Working for points. But could you imagine waking up in the jail cell thinking your life is through and there's an angel kicking you saying, let's go, quick. We got, we got to move. We got to get out of here. Like it's just not something that happens every day. It's not normal. It's interesting to me the urgency of the language that this angel uses when, uh, when talking to Peter. He right? says to him in verse 7, he says, quick, get up. As if to say, hurry, we got to move it. We don't have a lot of time. Let's go. Like, let, you know, Peter's like, hey, I'm just, I, I don't even know where I am. What's going on? Like, this angel is in a rush for some we- reason. He's not wanting to waste a moment. Maybe it was just to avoid a run-in with the guard or getting caught or something like that. Or maybe he was wanting to kind of give Peter a head start. You know, let's get out of here quick so you can find a safe place before they realize that you're gone. And We're not really sure. The Bible doesn't really provide for us the detail as to why that the angel was in such a rush. But as you read through the story, you discover later in the story that the guards actually didn't realize that Peter was missing until the dawn, until the morning, until they woke up. They'd probably been kind of in some supernaturally induced sleep and woke up in the morning and were like, oh my goodness, Peter is gone. They didn't even know he was gone for probably several hours until after he was gone. So the angel couldn't have really been worried about that. So it makes you wonder, what was the angel worried about? Well, again, the Bible doesn't really tell us, but here's a bit of a theory. It comes out of what the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, where he says this. He says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers of this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That for Peter, as much as the guards were a threat to him, as much as King Herod was a threat to him, as much as the executioner would have been a very real threat to him that next day, his struggle was not actually against prison guards or against executioners or against King Herod or anybody else. It was not against flesh and blood. Peter's struggle, Peter's battle, was against an unseen enemy, a spiritual enemy named Satan. 
and his angels, the church's spiritual enemy, God's spiritual enemy, who would have wanted nothing less than to destroy the work of God through the church as it was growing and multiplying and spreading the message of Jesus all over that known world. That was Satan's goal. It still is Satan's goal. Destroy the church. Tear down the people of God. Could you imagine if Satan would have had his way, would have somehow found a way to put an end to the church? in the book of Acts. Like, we wouldn't be sitting here. This message about Jesus and his love wouldn't be being spread across the world. Wouldn't have gotten to our ears and to our lives. And so it makes me wonder if maybe this angel was in a hurry. Maybe because not of the guards or of King Herod or what King Herod had planned the next day, but because of a spiritual battle that this angel was involved in. An unseen battle that this angel and maybe other angels had been fighting on behalf of God and behalf of the church in response to the church's prayers. In response to their earnest and constant prayers to get Peter out of jail. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against evil spirits in the heavenly realm. And I don't know, maybe that's what's going on in this story. And I know that that's kind of scary and creepy. You think about the devil, you think about demons, we can get all bent out of shape and worried and things like this, but uh, do you know that greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world? That we have the power of the resurrected Christ. Those of us who believe in Christ have the power of the resurrected Christ living within us. We serve a big Jesus, a big God, and it's the small devil. (laughs) It's not big devil, small Jesus. It's big God, small devil. We don't have to be scared of the work of the enemy. In fact, that's what the enemy tries to do. That's really his main play, is to scare us. To make us think that God's not who he really is, that he's not actually good, that we can't trust him. Tries to breathe fear into our life so that we can operate in a place of insecurity and out of a place of, I'm not good enough and I don't have what it takes. He whispers in our ear all the time things like, you don't have what it takes. And, uh, You'll never amount to anything, and and people don't like you for this reason or that reason. He's always, you know, the Bible calls him the accuser. He's the accuser. He's accusing us constantly of things that are not true. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And I wonder in our story, if there was some cosmic spiritual battle going on that the Bible doesn't give us detail about in order to see Peter released from prison. We... We don't know, the Bible doesn't give us those details, but one thing is for sure is that there's a battle raging around us all the time, that we are in the middle of a spiritual battle every moment of every day. Now that's a very real reality. I love the way uh, the Apostle Paul wraps up that section in Ephesians 6, where he kind of gives some advice on how to uh, uh, fight this battle, to be a part of this battle against Satan. He wraps it up and he says this in uh, Uh, Later on, he says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. He says, here's some things you can do to fight this battle against the enemy, but ultimately, here's your most powerful weapon. Prayer. Pray at all times. Again, at all times. Earnestly pray. Pray earnestly, constantly, in every occasion. Stay alert and persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Why? Because prayer makes a difference. In the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. I love this quote by an old author named E.M. Bounds where he says this. He says, God shapes the world by prayer. The more prayer there is in the world, the better the world will be. The mightier the forces against evil. The more we pray, the more God's will is done in our lives and on this planet. And therefore, the less we pray, the more the forces of evil have room to work. I don't know if you thought about that. It's a sobering thought. Our prayers are powerful. And the early church seemed to know this. It's why I think prayer was their plan A, why they didn't resort to just problem solving and coming up with a plan to bust Peter out of jail. It's why it was their go-to move. It's why they prayed earnestly, constantly for Peter. It's funny, back in our story in Acts 12, we read that as this was happening, as the angel was leading Peter out of the jail, it says that Peter actually didn't realize what was happening. Instead, it says that, you know, Peter thought he was having some sort of vision. He thought he was dreaming. He thought he was having some crazy, you know, out-of-body experience. Verse 9, it says, but all the time, as the angel led him out of the prison, he thought it was a vision. 
He didn't realize it was actually happening. But eventually Peter snapped out of it and, uh, and realized that this was very real. By the time Peter was outside uh, of the prison and in the streets, verse 11 says, says, finally Peter came to his senses. It's really true, he said, the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to me. It's like all of a sudden he just snapped out of it. You know when you wake up in the morning and sometimes there's those few seconds, you're in a fog and you're not really sure, was that a dream or did that actually happen last night? <laughs> Can I really fly? Or No, wait, no, I can't fly. Okay, I'm human. That's not possible. I can't. It's like Peter was in that state, in that fog, kind of following this angel out going, is this real? I must be. This kind of stuff doesn't normally happen. It's, it's, uh, it's funny to me. Sometimes when God shows up and when God works, we kind of, is this really God? Is this really happening? Or is this just my mind making this stuff up? Like this seems too good to be true. And sometimes it's God. Sometimes it's God performing a miracle. And we just need to wake up to see that. As the story continues, once Peter realizes that he was in fact not dreaming, he decides to get off the street and go to find his church community, his people who have been praying earnestly for him and to share with them this crazy news. And so he went to the house where they were staying, where the church was actually gathered in that moment for prayer, it says, presumably praying for Peter. And he knocked at the gate. And the text tells us that a servant girl came to the gate and heard Peter's voice. And instead of opening the door and letting him in, she freaked out. She couldn't believe it. And she ran back into the house and she started telling all the other church members, all the other apostles and disciples there, he said, you're not going to believe it. Peter is at the door. Peter's at the door. God's answered your prayers. He's here. <laughs> I, I love their, their response because I can totally relate to it. They've been praying earnestly for him, right? They've been asking God to perform a miracle and to be with Peter and begging God to rescue him. And, and now their prayers had been answered. So how did they respond to this girl, to the news? They said this, you're out of your mind. <laughs> There's no way, you know, no chance. You're crazy. There's no way Peter's standing at that door. This isn't, this is crazy talk. This is not possible. I said, you're out of your mind. And when she insisted, okay, somebody's at the door. That sounds like Peter. They said, well, it can't be Peter. There's no way. So it must be his angel. <laughs> it's more likely that it's his guardian angel standing at the front gate than it is Peter himself. There's no way it's Peter. It's got to be an angel. Somehow that was more feasible in their minds. But do you ever do this? Do you ever rationalize answers uh, to prayer, come up with a more feasible explanation than, you know, God has answered our prayers, God has responded? I know that I'm guilty for sure when we prayed um, for God to speak to us and to guide us about whether or not we should move to Ottawa, whether or not we should come be a part of this church community. And God started answering that prayer. And everywhere we turned, it was Ottawa this and Ottawa that. And someone saying to me, hey, I feel like God... Uh, has something new for you. I'm not sure what that means for you, but you should really th uh, think about that, pray into that. And I would be like, oh my goodness, this is God answering our prayer. But then I'd go away and I'd start doubting and I would start rationalizing. I'd say, well, they, they probably just like me. They think that I'm a good person. They didn't really hear from God. And oh, seeing Ottawa all over the place, it was probably just, I, Ottawa was always all over the place and now that's on my radar. Um, I'm just noticing it more. And I start rationalizing it because that's, that makes more sense to me than God actually answering my prayer, right? You guys ever do this? You know, we pray for friends who are sick, and then God does pull through. He doesn't always. We pray for people who are sick, and I, I've been there, done that, prayed for sick friends, and, and see them not get well. But there have been times where I prayed for sick people. There was a friend of mine, HIV positive, and his immune system collapsed, and he was on his deathbed in the ICU. 50-year-old man, 300-pound man, had a lot of other health complications. The nurses, the doctor said, we got to pull the plug. Like, he's near brain dead. In fact, at one point, they thought he was brain dead. And we said, we're just not feeling at peace here. we got to pray. And people looked at us and thought, you're some of those crazy Christians that can't let people just die in peace. You know, we're like, no, we just don't. So we prayed. And I remember going into the ICU unit and praying over him. And the next day, he woke up. And his first, his first words, apparently, were someone asked him, do you know he was here yesterday? And he said, Yancey. <laughs> Somehow he, he knew I was there. He had been alert enough and heard 
that we were there praying for him and God answered our prayer. But then I hear that and I go, wow, that's amazing. God answered our prayer. And, and yes, but then you take a step back. You go, well, what are, what, I think the medicine maybe just finally kicked in and the doctors finally kind of figured out how to treat him. And like, maybe it wasn't a miracle. And it's like, no, God answered our prayer, maybe through the doctors, but he answered our prayer, performed a miracle. I don't know if you do this, rationalize Come up with a more feasible explanation because it makes more sense in our minds than our brains. James 1 <clears throat> verse 6 says this, but when you ask God, when you ask him, when you pray and you ask him for something, be sure your faith is in God alone, not in human planning, human methods, explanations. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. It's a challenge, right? It's not saying we're not going to have doubts. We're not going to have times where we're not sure or whatever. But it's saying when you pray, have your faith be in God alone. Not in your own methods. Not in doctors. Not in people with advice. Like, trust in God. Doesn't mean we don't trust in people. That God's going to work through people. Remember, he works through people. 99.999% of the time. But have our faith in God. Believe that he will answer and can answer. Well, finally in our story... As we wrap up, the church, Peter's community, finally did come and open the door and saw that it was Peter. And they were amazed and celebrated. I'm sure that God had pulled through, that God had answered their prayers. And then they moved on to find a more safe spot because they knew when King Herod discovered that Peter was missing, that he wasn't going to stop. He was going to keep hunting them and keep coming after them. And he did. But they celebrated because God had answered their prayers. And all this happened... Because they prayed. But the church prayed earnestly for Peter. Constantly for Peter. That's the power of prayer. And so does prayer work? Does prayer make a difference in the real world? It absolutely does. Maybe not always in the ways that we think or hope that it will. I don't know if the early church actually thought God would send an angel to rescue Peter. They may have even been praying that he would just have courage as he was facing trials and suffering, that maybe they didn't even actually believe in their hearts that God was going to do the miracle that he ended up doing. But they prayed anyway. And God showed up in powerful ways. Sometimes, you know, it's hard because, again, we pray for things and, and prayers go unanswered and we wonder if and when God will pull through and answer these prayers and we're going to actually talk about next, that next week. That's what next week is all about. Unprayed prayers. Why some prayers seem to go unanswered. But one thing is for sure. And that is that unprayed prayers most certainly will not get answered. Right? Unprayed prayers will most certainly not get answered. If we don't pray, we will miss out on what God has in store for us. If we don't pray, there may be people that don't come to know Jesus. If we don't pray, there may be relationships and marriages that actually get destroyed. If we don't pray, there may be no healing. If we don't pray, if my people pray. James 4.2 says, you have not because you ask not. Right? Prayer makes a difference. Prayer changes things. And here's the point. You see it on the screen. It says this. Uh, there are things that God wants to do in this world that he will not do unless we partner with him in prayer. There are things that God wants to do in Ottawa that he will not do unless we partner with him in prayer. There's things that God wants to do in your life, in your family, in your relationships that he will not do unless we partner with him in prayer. If my people pray, prayer changes things. And so the question for us this morning is whether or not we'll become people of prayer, partners with God in this spiritual battle, this unseen spiritual battle that we find ourselves in, believing that prayer works. Prayer makes a difference. I hope you want to become those kind of people as I know that I do. I, I, just to have an encouragement, I just the thought came to mind now. There are people in here who have been praying for someone or something for a long time, for that person to come to know Jesus, for that person to be healed, there's no guarantees of how things are going to end, but here's the encouragement. Don't give up. Don't stop. Prayer changes things. Don't ever give up. 
There are things that God wants to do in this world that he will not do unless we partner with him in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, we believe that's true. We want to be people of prayer, people who seek you, people who see miracles, people who see you um, connect lost people to your heart, connect sick people to your heart, connect people who just need to know that they're loved to your heart. We want to see you work through us as your people, in our workplaces, in our families, in our communities. God, we, we need you. We want you. Make us into a people of prayer. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, if you're new here, uh, this is something we do every week. It's called Q&A. It's where you get to grill me, ask questions. Matt's here with the microphone. Fire away. First out of the starting gate. Um, so, uh, just one comment, which I, uh, I had overlooked, I guess, before in that, um, in that story, but uh, what struck me today I found interesting was the fact that Peter was asleep the night before his execution. To me, that's crazy. That says a lot about his faith, uh, yeah. as it is. Mm. Um, two questions. One, you mentioned that uh, there's evil spirits in the heavenly places, or in the heavenly Places. So I wonder if you can explain that a little bit more. And the second question is, um, what you're talking about? You have to pray the prayer. What if you're just thinking it? So you have to you have to go through an internal dialogue with God that's structured mm. like a prayer. Because if He knows what you want before you even think it, mm. How how are you supposed to, like if I'm thinking about issues or something that I'm trying to go through or that I want for somebody else, mm. uh, you know, and then I, you know, sort of God is, God is in the picture, but I'm not actually having an internal dialogue where I'm actually forming the sentences and saying right. the unsaid, right, uh, internally. Um, does that constitute prayer? So yeah, yeah. Two questions, right? The heavenly realms and kind of what constitutes prayer. Thoughts versus words. How do you... Yeah. First, firstly, uh, evil spirits in the, in the heavenly realm. Even last week when I taught through the Lord's Prayer, our Father in the heavens, the one who is in the heavens, the language that was being used there was to the atmosphere, to the area around us, to this world, to the environment. And it's the exact same language used here. It means all around us. <laughs> there are evil spirits, demonic angels at work, at battle, with heavenly forces, with God's angels, trying to vie for our attention, whispering accusations in our ear about how we're not good enough. So I think quite literally, it means we can't see them, we can't always feel them, we don't know what's going on, we don't need to be afraid of them, but it's real. There's a spiritual battle raging around us. No, it doesn't mean some planet somewhere else or some other realm altogether. It means in the realm around us. Um, secondly, the other prayer... I mean, for me, again, I think it's less about the method and more about the heart when it comes to prayer. So for me, when I'm reading the news and I read about what's going on in Iraq, I, I haven't stopped to start praying specifically for all the Christians being persecuted by all these different situations. But as I read the articles on CNN or, or wherever, it's just like, God, would you bring peace? It's just like a cry in my heart. I don't even necessarily say it out loud. It's just, oh, God, like in my spirit, I just, would you bring your peace? Would you like, reconcile this thing? Like, you know, and it doesn't have to be, you know, okay, hold on, I'm going to pause. If for you that works, go for it. I know some people have set, you know, their beep, uh, watches to beep on the hour every hour so they can pause for a minute to pray if that's helpful for you to do it. But I think prayer really is an ongoing internal and external dialogue. It's just kind of as we go through our day, as we're going to work, as we're hanging out with people, it's just like a, we're always aware of his presence. We're always kind of talking to him in our spirit. He knows our thoughts and our hearts. We don't need to say the words out loud. Um, I think that's the posture when Paul says, pray without ceasing. I think that's what he means. It's not that we need to become monks, but that we need to become people who are constantly in this posture, this heart attitude of prayer. Is that helpful? Anyone else? Jeff, I'm just going to ask you to clarify that a little bit more. Because then how, where's the difference between that and stewing on our problems. And without, what, sorry? And kind of stewing on our problems mm. without bringing God into it. I mean, is mm. it just that level of consciousness of 
okay, Lord, this is where my heart is. This is my hurts. This is my problems. Meet me here. Like, I'm giving these to you now as opposed mm. to just when you're thinking about them and processing them yeah, and trying yeah. to solve them yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think, not, not to say that you shouldn't ever stop and pray and consciously say things out loud. I think that's important. I think in any relationship, um, you know, I live with, with my wife Kim, of course. If we don't take time to actually intentionally talk and talk about what's going on in our lives and when we don't really have much of a relationship just because we live in the same house and we're kind of constantly talking about things that are going on in our lives doesn't mean that we don't have a real vibrant relationship if we don't press pause and take that time. So I think that's critical as well is for sure to take time you know, in the morning, in the evening, whenever it works for you, whenever you're kind of most alert and ready to spend time in prayer to talk about your problems, to talk about what's going on in your life, to pray through the Lord's Prayer uh, for yourself, I, I think that's absolutely very critical. So I, I wouldn't want either for people to think, oh, I can just kind of go through my day and just always talk to God and I don't need to actually stop and pray. I think that's an important component as well. So, yeah, good question. Is, oh. Just kind of what you just, following up on what you said, I wondered what, I wondered what the synonyms or what the actual dictionary definition of earnestly is because mm. that's to me like a, a real conversation of from the heart but the word kind of feels like uh, yeah yeah er earnestly at least in, in uh, the passage in Acts is referring to the word constantly it was an ongoing prayer and so for them, I think literally for the early church, it wasn't just a, I'm going to go to work and do my thing and I'll remember Peter in the back of my mind. I think they actually pressed pause and literally constantly started praying. Like it was, they were together collectively praying. We see that even when, um, when they came, when, when Peter broke out of jail, he went to the house and it says they were praying. That's just what they happened to be doing because that's what they were doing for probably however many days he was in jail. So I think it's, there are seasons where we just press pause and it's like I'm devoting this time and a season to prayer, to seeking God, and there's the other posture is constantly in our heart, an ongo ongoing conversation, ongoing uh, prayer in our day with, with God. Yeah. I think Natalie had a question too. <laughs> um, you had a, a, a scripture up there that sort of answered my question, but it's something I still struggle with. You had James 1, 6 up there, um, and it was, you know, when you pray, rely on, on God alone. And that's something that I struggle with, because like your friend in the ICU, if, if you're praying for him to be healed, and yet he never was checked into the hospital, would God have been able mm. to, I mean, you know, God uses the doctors to, to help heal him. Maybe that's the way that you, he's doing it. So, and I have a, a hard time, because often I'm praying, but I'm also, at the same time, you know, I, I'm taking the wheel and I'm trying to drive the car mm. instead of just letting it, letting God um, act with his will. Mm -hmm. And it, for me, it's hard to know when I need to rely on God's will or I need to do, there's something that God needs me to do in order to fulfill mm. my prayer and his will. And mm -hmm. I, I struggle with that. Yeah, I think, I think we all do. <laughs> I think, unfortunately for some of us, when we think of someone, or when we think of faith, sometimes we think faith is not doubting. You need to be really sure. So when you pray, pray with faith, believing that God's going to answer this prayer. And if you doubt, God's not going to answer your prayer. It's why sometimes people say, oh, if God didn't heal that person, it's because you didn't have enough faith. That's not what the Bible actually teaches. Faith is not about how sure you are. It's about who you're putting your trust in, Right? It's about us actually saying, I can't do this. I was talking to someone this morning and they were saying things in the business were kind of not working. And finally I just gave up and said, I can't, I can't generate enough business on my own. I need to trust you. And suddenly, boom, there was, there was business. That's faith. It's actually putting our faith into God, choosing to trust him. And I think when we pray, it's not saying that we, we are we're refusing to believe or, or realize that this is very, you know, real, that, that this person could die or that this person may not come to faith. Like, that's just real. That's, we can't, that's not doubting, that's being honest. Um, but it's saying, uh, we can't 
but you can. And if there's any hope for the situation, it's because of you and not us. I think that, for me, would be the hard attitude and posture that I'd want to have in those situations. It's not coming in saying, okay, if I really believe, God will answer. Well, at what point is enough belief enough? Like, how does that work? Um, I'm not, you know, I don't think that's the way God works, so, yeah. Fantastic. Anyone else before we wrap up? Oh, we got a few hands. Okay. This prayer, prayer topic is important. That's good. Oh, we got like three hands. My goodness. I just, um, more than anything, just wanted to share something that I find very helpful in my prayer life. Um, I find that for sure, I will not always see God's answer. And I just have to have that faith that he will work through mm. where my heart is with him. But I think the most beautiful thing about the relationship I, that God and I have is that when I'm really down about him not doing what I think he should be doing in the way he should, because I'm a short-term gratification kind of gal. I like to see things happen. I like things checked off my list. Mm. And if God's got a long-term plan ahead of me and I'm praying in the short term and I'm wanting this now, God, we're made in his image. And so when I see him like a parent, like I am with my kids, when my kids are saying, I need you to give me this or to do this in this way. And I'm like, you know what, honey? I have way more life experience than you, and mm. I can see a lot farther ahead down the road than you. That's not what you need to do in the short term. And I want you to ask me, and I want you to be close to me, and I want to know what's in your heart, but I am going to take the longer road. Mm. But I will show you bits and pieces of how my love for you is going to help you in your lifetime, and I'm going to draw mm. your attention to that. So often I will ask God, to show me small windows of what he's doing yeah. so that I stay encouraged and I stay praying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard it said this way, that if we knew the things that God knew, we'd know why he responded the way he did to our prayers or the way he didn't, right? I think we yeah, don't have the same perspective. That's, that's a great comment. Now, there's a couple more questions. One over there by, by Tanya. Hello. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one, I'm just missing uh, the verse for the uh, unprayed prayers because I think that's important and it points to how powerful and important prayer is. And my second question is um, kind of like entering into a season of prayer and uh, like devotion to like something specific in your life. And uh, what are your experiences in that and like how have they changed from start to finish? Mm. So the first question was about unprayed prayers. Like the comment I made about unprayed prayers going unanswered. Yeah, I think, I mean, that was my way of capturing what James said. And, and there's other verses too where, where it says that you have not because you ask not, you know. Um, I think that's, that's a principle th about prayer throughout the scripture that, you know, if you want to see God show up in a, in, a, in a certain way, we need to ask. You have not because you ask not. Second question uh, was about how we can, sorry, I kind of might want to. For something specific and what your experiences uh, are in that and like if they've changed mm -hmm. um, direction in that or if they've yeah. uh, stayed the same and you, you've been able to like gain a focus on that and like yeah. a more specific direction. Yeah, I mean, I can think of my own journey. I, I mentioned it in my message about when we were trying to discern whether or not to come here. And we prayed about it. We committed a season of time to prayer over that and, and God started to show up and guide us. And even though we were sort of doubting and not sure, trying to rationalize it, it was pretty clear that God was working. I can think of our friends. And in fact, we left a couple friends that we've been journeying with in Niagara, where I'm from. And we've been praying for them to come to faith for some time. And we've been seeing progression. They hadn't, you know, gotten to the place yet where they were ready to really fully surrender their lives to Christ. But they were, they were 
getting more engaged in our small group, our home church. They were asking some really good questions. They were starting to show up to church more regularly on Sundays. It was really clear that God was at work. And even since we've been here, we've gotten emails of them trying to organize meals for someone in our old group that had a baby. And we were just thrilled to see that they're taking ownership of the group and kind of into what's going on there. We, we saw that as evidence of God at work, responding to our prayers, that their hearts were being softened. And, and I've seen other friends come to faith. We prayed and, and prayed for friends of ours to come to faith and it, it took a long time. It wasn't like a overnight thing. We had the privilege of baptizing people that we've been praying for, praying for sick people who were really sick and we saw them, you know, uh, uh, be healed and, uh, and get well. And, and uh, it doesn't always happen the way that we think it would or the way that we hope and pray that it would. But I think, again, we have not because we ask not and we need to be committed to entering into that season of prayer. So, Fantastic. Oh, the, you have not, because you asked that, that was James, let me, James 4-2. Yeah. Wrap up. Let's wrap up. I'm going to invite the stage, or I'm going to invite the stage, I'm going to invite the band back on the stage, and uh, we're going to have a time of response here this morning. There's a, there's a great story that I want to share with you. In fact, I'm going to read it for you. It's by, told by a guy named Pastor Tony Campolo. And it's about a random prayer uh, and how it wasn't so random in his life. I'll, I'll just read it here for you. It says this. It says, Years ago, Tony was slated to speak at a Pentecostal college chapel service in Pennsylvania. Before the service began, eight men escorted Tony into a back room and had him kneel, place their hands on his head, and begin to pray over him. Tony thought this was a good idea at first, but the longer they prayed, the more fatigued they became, and the more fatigued they became, the more uh, they began to lean down on Tony's head. And the more they leaned on him, the more Tony began to wonder if it was such a good idea. To make matters worse, one of the men wasn't even praying for Tony. The well-intentioned gentleman was praying for some guy named Charlie Stolfus. Tony remembered the prayer. Dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side. Tony remembered thinking, do you really believe uh, you have to remind God of where this Charlie guy lives? But the man continued praying, Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God. Bring that family back together. The men finally finished their praying and Tony shared his message. After the service was over, Tony excused himself, pulled onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike to return home and saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road. Here's what happened next in Tony's own words. We drove a few minutes until I said, Hi, my name's Tony Campolo. What's your name? He said, Charlie Stolfus. I couldn't believe it. I got off the turnpike at the next exit, he headed back, and he got a bit uneasy with that after a few minutes, and he said, Hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. <laughs> he narrowed his eyes and asked, Why? He said, I said, Because you left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And with shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off of me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. When I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know I lived here? And I said, God told me. And I believe God did. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. And Charlie whispered in her ear. And the more he talked, the more bigger her eyes got. Then I saw, then I said with real authority, the two of you sit down right now. I'm going to talk to you and the two of you are going to listen. <laughs> Man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two young people to Jesus Christ. In fact, I remember hearing Tony share that story. And he said that Charlie Stolfus is in fact a pastor today. It's an incredible story, and the reality is, is that there's a lot of Charlie Stolfuses in our lives that need to hear the message of the love of Jesus and need that kind of prayer. And so, we're going to do now, the band's going to lead us in a song, How He Loves Us. Oh, how he loves us. And what we're going to do is I'm going to encourage each and every one of you this week, if you are someone who prays and wants to start praying this week. Remember, it's not about the method. It's about the heart. It's about just 
coming before him with what we've got. I'm going to invite each and every one of you to come forward and grab one, two, three, four post-it notes. And this week I want you to take those post-it notes, however many you choose to take, and I want you to put it in a place on your bathroom mirror, in your office desk, in your car, on your dashboard, wherever it is that you'll see it every single day so that we can pray for these names. We don't know their stories. They aren't necessarily people we put up on here, but we want to pray for these people that God would reveal himself to them because we believe that prayer changes things. We see it as evidenced in this Charlie Stolfus' life. We've seen it evidenced in many of our lives and there's many more people out there that need to know that God loves them. So as Shayla and the band leaves us, leads us, I'm going to invite you to come forward and grab a post-it note this morning so that we can pray for these people in our community this week. Would you come forward and join me?